statists. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this talk, uh, Why and How Build a Real-Time Collaborative Musical Application. So my name is Raphael Danger. I'm uh, the lead developer of HomeForce. And over the years, so maybe some of you actually know HomeForce, we've been making plugins like uh, Homicide or Homeboys. And in 2012, we've been doing Home Studio, the first time real-time, the first real-time uh, collaboration DAW. Um, so, who has been using Google Doc here? Please raise your hand. Google, yeah, it's fairly almost everyone. Okay, so it's, it's going to be like very simple. Like in a nutshell, uh, nutshell um, uh, Home Studio is the Google Doc of DAWs. Okay. So, um, because you've been always using like uh, Google Docs, uh, do you remember before how it was actually before Google Docs? So you would work, let's say, uh, you would work on your PhD thesis or, for example, uh, writing real, um, uh, specifications for, for your team. You would work uh, probably in actually in a Word, Microsoft Word, for example, and you would write something. And then you would start actually like to exchange files like with people. And as you start actually to do that, those people are going to make some modifications and send it back. All this happened by emails, remember? That was like, yeah, some time ago. And then you would need actually to integrate the modification and so on. And then that would actually get quite complex. And that's when there is only two people, but when there is three people, that gets to be actually a really a nightmare. So even now, actually, like in some fields, uh, some people are still using uh, Microsoft Word, for example, like in, in law. And here, actually, we have a, an example of uh, a contract we had uh, with a company for this technology. And all actually like the different actually version and all actually it was get all messy. And I think like, I don't know if you can see it, but there is one of my favorite probably is like this contract V2 final V2B, you know? So, and that's actually pretty common. Um, so if we look at the why from more, let's say a market point of view, and I think it's really actually interesting. So Google Doc actually was released in 2009, okay? And what you see actually is depending on the field, like the market shares uh, between a Microsoft Word and uh, uh, Microsoft Office and Google on uh, yeah, different fields. And then you can see actually on our like more market, like software, internet, for example, and marketing and advertising, uh, Google manage to get like almost half of the market. These pictures here is like for 2016 and they were releasing in 2009. So they managed to take like almost half of the market in just seven years. So that's actually like something like really, uh, really big. And then you might think like, okay, so this is the office market, you know, like so maybe the music market is different. And so on other markets, like for example, on shape, they are doing computer assisted design. Um, so that's actually something where they go, uh, they go like with uh, real-time collaboration. And bringing that actually, they manage to have a valuation of their company in just one year of 800 million, okay? That represents like a quarter of the market leader. That's, yeah, something big. Like when you think about it, like one year and already a quarter of the market leader. Figma is finally like a concurrence to Adobe Illustrator. Same thing, Play Canvas is a game engine. And Envision uh, managed to raise 50 millions, okay, just to bring real-time collaboration. Actually, if some of you actually knows actually this company, just uh, you know, like tell us, tell them like actually we do it for less. So, just in case. So, that's from the market perspective of things. But then there is also like things that are more specific actually for our market. So here I'm going to talk more a bit about Home Studio. And there is like a first question actually as we were starting actually like to get to know more users because like the market was really new, like we wanted to know like, okay, like tons of questions, and one of them was, why did you come actually in the first place? So we made a survey of uh, like a thousand people uh, using Home Studio for at least six months, and we asked them many questions, and there was, there was, for example, this question like, did you come for productivity or quality? Meaning like, when you are working in a team, actually you tend to have like a better productivity or better, you can achieve better quality. So that was one thing. The other thing is like, yeah, I came because I wanted like to make music with my friends. And this last point, like I came for learning. So let's say like, who thinks it's productivity and or quality? Please raise your hand. 
No one? <laughs> Make music with my friends. OK. <laughs> or learning. <laughs> OK. So yeah, so yeah, almost everybody wins. It's like they came in the first place actually like to, um, you know, to uh, make music together. But the pattern that we saw actually emerge that we didn't actually see that much coming is that even if they come to make music to, uh, together, at some point actually like they value actually more actually the learning experience. So they came to make music with their friends, but they stay actually for, for learning. So this is a really quite generic quote, but we've got actually two of them basically saying this. I've learned in one year what it took me like 10 years to learn before. That's pretty actually intense. And um, I guess like one way actually to see it is uh, I think we've been all like uh, with our tools or like, or like fields of interest, probably like reading, for example, an article, you know? So that's one thing, like, for example, like to learn about something or watching like video tutorials. Who didn't like watch like video tutorials? But then actually, like, with some collaboration, I've had like um, a different dimension to it, which is more actually learning by doing. That's basically changed everything. So seeing all that, and also seeing that bringing real-time collaboration as a technology actually was quite difficult, um, we decided actually like to package what we had in Home Studio to, to make Flip. Uh, so this framework package that people can use. It's already actually version two. It's kind of like almost like 10 years in research, like all in all. And it's got a more exposed core and that allows like to bring new usage of the technology, for example, things like device continuity. So what is Flip? Flip is a cross-platform transactional data framework real-time collaboration oriented. Okay? <laughs> so that's a lot of buzzword and things, but I mean, it's, that's not buzzword, actually. We are going to break down, actually, this into like multiple pieces so that you can have really, actually, the full picture of it. So first thing, let's go back to the beginning. We are making products, okay? And making a product is having an understanding on, or a vision of what our users want, okay? That's really important. So let's say like we have a user, okay? And they want to make a song, okay? Not a symphony, a song. And let's say that our user is uh, Western, so they will have like the concept of, they want the concept of tempo. Then we can say like a song as a tempo, okay? And as soon as we start actually to say that, we start to have like something which is called a data model. We've got elements of data and relations between those elements of data. So for us, as we are considering almost only actually user-facing application like mobile or desktop application, we can assume a hierarchical uh, mental model, which means that if a user sees a jar of cookie and they put this jar of cookie in the trash, the jar in the trash, they will expect the cookie actually to be in the trash. That's not always the case, but that's actually like a common model like for user-facing application. So that's it, like for the relations. And also, there is this thing where a user see a cookie, it will expect not a banana. It's actually two different things. And that brings actually something for us, like so this strong typing that we know, like for us, like C++ developers, that allows us to scale things, that allows us like to scale data models. Those are implementation strategies. So like the um, relation, so basically saying that ownership is probably actually the most common uh, relation in user-facing applications. That's one thing. And then like bringing actually strong types, okay? So a bit more code. Can you see it actually? Like, yeah, yeah, I hope. Um, so we've got like some types. So like here, it's like some kind of JSON where we have some song and the song actually has a property, which is a tempo, okay? Then we can say something, and it's really important, that a document is going to be an instance of a data model, like an object is an instance of a class, okay? And we want, actually the users want, to modify actually this document. So here, for example, we are directly uh, changing actually the tempo, okay? And that's actually symbolized like the user intention, okay? So we could actually change, like we could make actually different change. Here you've seen a commit, exactly like in Git. 
and that would be actually in your commit, you could have like different files that are changed, but in the end, like you've got your commit message and that's actually your intention. Like, how did you want actually like to change like your Git repository? The same thing actually here is like, how do you want to change it? And that is actually a transaction units that represents actually your user intention. And finally, we have like one or multiple observers actually to see to watch the changes on, on those documents. And we will come back a bit later to that. So now, Flip is a data model framework, okay? It's transactional, so this is this idea of user intention and also like semantically valid states. It's cross-platform because we support Windows, uh, Linux, Mac OS, iOS. We are also running on small devices like Raspberry Pi. And even if it's written in C++, it's, we have also language binding with Swift, JavaScript, and even functional language like Elm, for example. And finally, it's real-time collaboration oriented. So it really looks like, hey, okay, but where is this real-time co real collaboration oriented part? And for this, we need to go back a bit more actually into history with, with what is called the CCI model. So CCI model was introduced as soon as 1998, so it's actually pretty old, by Shenzhen and maybe actually some of you know about it. It's, let's say, the father of operational transformation. So, and he developed actually the CCI model, which is more actually a mental model uh, about real-time collaboration. And I think like every technology, like CRDT, Flip, and operations transformation are based on, actually on this model. So, CCI model stands for convergence, causality, and intention. So, convergence says that if two people are collaborating and they stop at some point, like uh, doing things on like both their documents, at some point of time, like the two documents are going to be in sync. That's convergence. Causality preservation, I'm not going to uh, um, go into details because Flip has automatically that. And user intention preservation is these things we talked before. It's like, for example, if the user intention is to insert one track between two tracks, we just want to make sure that this track is not going to be to appear actually after those tracks if there was like some over edit of someone that would make it different. That's getting the inter user intention. User intention was, I want to insert track between those two tracks, okay? And here, as soon actually we see that, it's like, remember we say like user intentions are also actually transactions. So what we need to do is just to say that we want those transactions to be concurrent, okay? So how does Flip that? So here you can see um, uh, it's like some piece of uh, code uh, somehow. Um, that's actually the assembler of Flip because Flip is a virtual machine that's got like some actually nice properties. So one is actually to execute programs. Woo. And, but the, another one, which is really much more interesting, is like it can actually execute programs backwards. Meaning that if you um, run one program one way and then in the other way, you are going to get back to exactly the same machine state, okay? And that's all rolls back and actually like having like transaction out of orders that you can put actually back into orders. So that's one thing. And so what is Flip? Flip is a runtime for this virtual machine and a collections of concurrent lock-free algorithms for this machine, okay? So clear for everyone? Good. So there will be some demo time. Um, I made a, a little uh, host, actually, DAW, on my free time. Um, and uh, it's really small. But before actually we get into that, we just need actually like to see some things that are a bit more actually specific actually to flip. So the first thing is like, how do we observe a change? And then another very actually common thing in development is like how do we bind model and view objects? So starting actually with observing, the thing is, remember that we can actually like see actually tons of different change actually that make a transaction. So we don't necessarily actually see the atomical change, but just like change as a whole. So for value, like for example, like tempo, most of the time you are going to be just interested actually into the new value. Most probably probably don't care so much about the old, sometimes yes, but there is an old actually new value. And you can only consider the new state, it's probably actually it's fine. But for something like actually um, interacting with containers, for detecting like added elements or removed or even moving elements, the thing is like it's a bit different because you want actually the previous state to see what it's 
removed, what has been removed, and you want actually the new state to see actually what was added. Basically, you want to see like a combined actually version of it, and that's basically what we are doing. We want the whole new state and also see the difference, so we are just combining the two to really actually see what's going on. So we are still being able to see like the new tempo, like before, and we have actually one uh, container that we can just pass to see if there was removed element or not. Uh, one idea is like if you had actually to do this um, by just iterating like through the two trees, you need actually to maintain like those two iterators and it can be quite actually complicated. But when you start actually to merge thing, you just have one actually tree to iterate on. This makes like code really much more simpler. That's all actually we observe in Flip. Um, and finally, uh, about binding uh, things. So usually you've got in more like model first architectures, model objects, and then when those views that represent models are going to appear, you are going actually like, to create them. So usually it's fine for the view to know about the model. So here, for example, we've got like a GUI song um, uh, class that's going to take like a model song actually object uh, as a reference. So that's fine. But uh, as developers, uh, we know that when the model actually starts to know about the views, that's, and that I think uh, bites us uh, somewhat at every point of our life uh, when we were younger somehow, but that's something actually we know actually we can't do. And that's never actually going to scale. There will be actually like problems like all, um, always. So how can we solve that? One way to solve that, so it's very actually like flip specific, but anyway, is to say that the observer actually is probably actually the only one that can know about like a model and the view actually it represents, okay? And in this case, because we still actually want to be able to iterate the model and, and then extract like the GUI elements, what we want is basically like to store in some way like those references or having even like the object itself into actually the model objects. And we do that like through what is called an entity. And an entity is a map from a type to an instance of this type. And that's great because we do this through a type erasure, meaning that the model actually can own objects that it doesn't need actually to know about, okay? So that's what we do. So for example, we have a model song, we get the entity actually from it, and then we on place like a key, which is GUI song, and model song is going to be like the parameter constructor, constructor parameter. And then that's going to return a GUI song, like an, uh, an, object, uh, an object which is a GUI song, okay? Same thing like we can use it, so get it, and we'd throw, for example, if there was none, and we can also erase, okay? So now let's get to demo. So I'm just going to mirror those displays. So can you see something, yeah? Looks good. So here, actually very small on my screen. So I, I've made like, um, so this kind of really small horse, only actually is a GUI part. And um, so it's a bit small, but I can make it maybe bigger. Uh, we've got a song uh, with tracks, so here, like, for example, looking at the tracks, track is going to have a name, like a color, which is an enum, and got some properties like mute, solo, and harm record, got some clips, clips contain some notes, and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And um, so we made, like, a, um, so there is a new technology we made where from actually that we can generate code, okay? So I did it, like, um, also I made something special, actually for, for this presentation, like to generate actually uh, things for this presentation. And so as soon actually as we generate code, that's going actually like to give something like that. So this is like, for example, like for the track, you can see it's create an enum, and then it's going to have a flip string, so that's like a string in flip, like some enum, like some bool, and, uh, and that's it. So here, what we have is like, what I made is um, um, a juice application. So how many people are familiar with juice here? Please raise your hand. Okay, great. So yeah, I will not necessarily actually go into like so much details about juice itself, but let's see actually what it looks like. It appears in the right screen. And build or so. Okay, so we have that. Let's run another one. Okay, so I'm running two instances, actually, of the same application, and, and they are going, actually, to connect, like, to each other automatically. So, demo time. Is it going to work? 
Great, yeah, it works. So you can see here, for example, if I do that, it's going to work. I can actually move this thing here, that's great. And um, so I've got undo for now, like for example, for this, automatically, we're going to see, it's quite nice. I didn't put undo here for now on this thing because I'm going to show you, like if I have enough time, like a really nice actually technique. And this technique will be about like, when I do that, like usually and actually when I uh, remove, like when I hand my gesture, I want like the underlying clip like to be cut, actually. And here it's not doing that. And we are going to do the same, but even actually cutting every time actually during the gesture, not only at the end, like during the gesture. Okay, so that's what actually the application looks like. And so, um, yeah, so here it's actually divided in um, multiple parts. We have like the header on the left, so what is called head after, and the, the seconds uh, on the right. So let's start actually with the header actually to see what it looks like. It's going to be quite simple. So when there is a, so first thing is the header is going to be a juice component, okay? And this juice component is on this, uh, so song, GUI song, basically is going to have a reference here like to, to the model song, okay? And then it's also going to have like an observer which is going to watch on a document, okay? And, and then here I have a lambda like just to call like document change so we can see and watch uh, changes of the do document. And that's basically it. Paint is just painting the temple on the lower left, no, uh, higher, upper left. And so when we change the documents, like what we would do only for tempo is just called repaint of juice. And when actually we had tracks, we can see, we can call song.tracks directly, dot change, so there was like some changes like in the tracks themselves or any actually things below. We can just iterate very simply, like okay, so let's iterate over the tracks here. And so this is where we are going to see this entity thing, where if a track was added, get the model track identity and place a GUI track, giving those arguments to the constructor, and that's going to re uh, return a GUI track, okay, which is also a juice component that we had and make visible, okay? It's going to be the same with removed, okay? We remove the juice component, and then we erase the key, which calls the destructor of the GUI track. And when the track change or anything actually below, we are just going to call document change on it. And then to see actually what it looks like and first piece of interactions. So when we call repaint, so it's going to paint actually all the stuff, so it's a bit boring, but the idea is we can, for example, here, just access like the model name very simply and yeah, just then call juice with this string, basically. And finally, when the document changes, we just repaint, okay? So now that actually our GUI track as a reference to the, to the model track, we can also see, okay, what does it look like to actually change the model? And as actually you can see, it's pretty actually easy. So we are just accessing this model solo and we are just toggling it. So in the case where, for example, we click into like the, the solo rec, so here just with a little rectangle, and then we call commits and we put a label. So this actually label is something that, uh, so this commit with a label is something actually that was generated uh, for Flip where we have like a document, we have two commit functions. So one is actually without an undo step and the other one is with an undo step. We have by default here like an history, which is stored in memory. And then we have like functions like undo and redo. And so you don't need actually like to code anything like action classes that just basically going to do it by itself. Like the only thing I had like to, to have undo was just calling commit with a label and then like flip, understand like the transaction and everything and just doing it and then that's just basically fine. So that's it for the track, okay? And now let's see something a bit more funny. So on the second spot where we have all our clips, when the document is changed, we are just basically going to, to make exactly like the same pattern. We iterate over track, we iterate over clips. When a clip is added, we are going to in place, like we are going to create a GUI clip uh, for it and, add and make it visible. It's exactly actually the same change and the document is changed, like the clip is changed, going to be repainted. There is actually nothing actually crazy about it. And, but there is just like one thing I would want to see 
if we have enough time, but it seems okay. Where, um, so usually actually, how do we do this with gesture? Like the general pattern that's going to work every time is you are going to store uh, like some cache of things actually you are going to modify. So for example, in this example, I'm just going to cache the start position. That was actually the model value of the position of the clip at the time I started the gesture. I'm going to cache this, and then when I'm going actually to drag, I'm just going to get like this start position, and then I'm going to add like this guess distance from drag start x from uh, juice. And no wonder actually why it's, it's uh, you know, I think in juice actually in the event, you can't necessarily have really simply like just the latest delta. And why? Because like most of the time actually you want this actually distance from the very start. For example, if you have to do clamping, it's actually better like to do it like from start position or more complex algorithm like for example like snapping uh, your for example clip on a grid. That's why it's done like that. But now let's say we want like to to cut this um, uh, as we move. We want like to cut like und the underlying clips that we might have at the same time. So I'm just going to to change that. I'm going actually to explain what we want to do. Okay, so let's build that. Yoo-hoo. Oh yeah, this will stop the other. Okay, it's here, and maybe here. So you see maybe like a tiny bit of, um, like, um, uh, what is it called? Yeah, so you can see basically it's cutting the thing, okay? So then now actually I can do that, and then I can do undo and things, and you see actually just like to have like this kind of behaviors of cutting and things, like the only things I had to do was just like those three lines, okay? So it's really actually not crazy. So it looks magic, okay? Maybe there is like tons of things into this document session, not so much. So let's see how it works internally. So let's say we've got like this red clip that we want like to, to displace. So the first time actually uh, we are going to, to move it, we are going to cut the, the thing, create this first move, which is going to make a transaction. This transaction is going also to be another step, and we are going to commit, and then the observers are going to see that uh, this clip has been actually cut, so the position and duration of the clip actually change, and maybe actually some notes disappeared. So this thing about the cache, what usually actually you do in applications when you are doing like this kind of move, is you are going to make, you are going to make a copy some more, more or less, uh, of your entire track, so then you can just actually revert to the original position and then apply your algorithm again. But the thing is like, as soon as I actually show those, um, uh, those arrows, then you can see that we just actually need to have like something that would be the inverse of this transaction just to get back to the original state. And you remember that Flip can run those programs, those transactions, back uh, forward and backward. So we just need actually to execute it backward and then we are exactly in the same state. So very simple. Then we, on the next move, when, so then we are moving things so that's occurring like doing like just like a little displacement, rollback, then apply our algorithm again. And when we are going to commit so that it's just like these little arrows, meaning all observers, they don't see the intermediate state. You just see actually this little difference that can be just like a few things for your audio engine not to recreate like everything or whatever. And at the same time, actually, this move is also actually our under steps. So we are just going to replace our last under steps. So what does actually those three lines of code, they are doing nothing more actually than that. And suddenly actually realize, so if you've been, uh, some of you like making DAWs or even like a quite like desktop applications, that's a very, very common pattern that you just kill with flip in just three lines, basically. So obviously, um, time is almost over, but um, uh, there is much more in flip. You've got tons of more types, you've got maps, you've got variants, you've got optionals, you've got blobs, vector, you've got object references, you've got messagings. There is something very important, uh, it's called system invariants. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with it, like everything like constraining actually your data model, like uh, I don't know, like for example, you need to have values in bounds, for example, direction needs to be uh, positive, for example. It's called also semantic validation. Uh, we've got a very strong model conversion system, so it's when you are upgrading actually your model, you, uh, you, you 
you do just want to make sure that you are doing it well and you are not going to introduce bug because it would mean loss of data. Uh, Flip is multi-thread and multi-process. Uh, we can very easily duplicate, copy-paste objects that's come out of the box. We've got serialization in different document formats. There is a binary format, very fast, super robust and secure, and there is um, a text format that you can edit by end. Um, you've got things like uh, reflection, because Flip is using a uh, reflection paradigm uh, a lot, so you can have access to it. And you have even like fancy stuff like persistent undo history, like uh, save on this, meaning your undo history can be actually brought back after your document has been closed. And, but yeah, but I hope like if you just need just to remember one thing, this is quite a long list, there is tons of more, um, is that Flip is actually really simple uh, to, to do your application. That's really actually one thing. And also it's not vaporware, it's 10 years of research and it's here now. Um, so I hope you enjoy the talk and maybe do we have like some time for questions? And then, uh, because we start at four, we have a bit of time, but uh, yeah, so one question. Right. Um, so when your, as your model gets more complicated, um, in your redraw logic there, you have a lot, potentially a lot, an explosion of branching, because you have, if this, if this property was deleted, if this was updated, if this was moved, like, have you got any kind of strategy to uh, prevent this and make this more, like, I uh, guess, more simple, like less branching? So branching off? Of code. Like, you'll have lots, you're going to, in the draw loop, yeah. you have, okay, the model was updated. Yeah. Then you have this property, do this if this property was deleted, do this if this property was updated. You know, like, and that can get very complicated very quickly, and the source of bugs can get. Can yeah, yeah. So this is actually like the um, like usual. Like, so this is like a very raw way uh, to to do it, um, because bringing a generic algorithm at that point sometimes also uh, that actually bites you know back. Um, but actually, we we found. Uh, something very interesting question. Um, so this code generator uh, we've made, uh, so it's written actually in Python, and it's just like uh, generate things and things. And what we can do actually with it, which is really interesting, is we can make convenience actually for that. So let's say actually you see like uh, this pattern repeating over and over again. So us, we, for example, know from experience, like for uh, home studio, that yeah, but sometimes actually there will be actually little things. And if you start actually to abstract it and to try and constrain it, at some point it's going to bite back because there will be this case that actually is not going to work. So here, you know, like sometimes uh, um, this kind of generic thing, sometimes actually we've made with inheritance that's going actually to work like uh, most of the time. And then you are going actually to have this thing about, oh yeah, but this time actually we would need to have something. So one case is for example, like you would like iterate like through a tree, so like, Every time, actually, you are going to have like uh, callbacks, uh, like uh, and using polymorphism, actually, like to call into that, and then you suddenly realize, like, oh wait, but I need to pass my tree twice. So you are going to have like uh, I know, like um, pass or actually traverse, and then you are going to make a function like a new virtual function called pass traverse, and that's where actually things got uh, goes wrong. But if you want that, we can also actually build convenience. Uh, for you so that you can test and see it's going to start to bite and then actually you can go actually to the systems or not because maybe in your application that's totally fine. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. All right, thank you. So we start again in about a